Welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. When it comes to HIV and AIDS, and that's something we haven't talked about recently in public, but when it comes to HIV and AIDS, in the central Illinois region, which runs from the Mississippi up to LaSalle County, down to Mason County and over to uh, McLean, the number one and number two counties in the number of cases, Peoria and McLean. And so we're going to have a discussion about treatment, funding, and prevention of HIV and AIDS with a panel of four experts. And first, let me welcome Stacy Wolf to the program. Stacy, thank you so much for joining us. She is the executive director of Central Illinois Friends, mm -hmm. basically support services. Exactly, okay. yes. And seated across from her is Pam Briggs. Pam is the director of Heart of Illinois HIV AIDS Center mm -hmm. that is located at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Peoria. Uh, also with us is Aaron Johnson. Aaron is the HIV counselor and educator for the McLean County Health Department. Thank mm -hmm. you for being here. Thank you. And Chris Wade is here. Chris is living with HIV and we're going to be talking about his story in just a moment. But first, the definition is in order. Just to refresh our memories, HIV and AIDS, Pam, can you give us a, the brief Overview? description? Yes. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. It's a virus that uh, attacks the fighter cells or CD4 cells in your immune system. And if it attacks strong enough and destroys your CD4 count, you can go into a diagnosis called AIDS, which is Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Once you have crossed into that uh, diagnosis, it, your immune system is extremely challenged and mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult to fight some of the more common infections and diseases that you and I are faced with daily. And because it's a virus, it actually takes over cells. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you say CD4 cells, uh, some people may know those as T cells. T cells mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, with that, uh, how many cases, now, now I was describing region two, they divide the state up into regions, we're region two which goes from the Mississippi over to McLean and north and south from there, 15 counties. How many cases do we have? In, in 2014 there was a total of 829 individuals living with HIV that we know of in region two. And that's HIV only? or HIV and AIDS. And AIDS, mm -hmm. okay. Correct. And is, is there some better way of, I mean, HIV and AIDS, AIDS just seems to be a, an extension of HIV when it becomes a little bit worse? Um, there's actually a, and I guess we don't have medical staff here with us, but there's actually a, a threshold that one crosses within their viral load when it, when it is that how there's you would CD, describe it? Well, there's CD4. Okay. What happens is the virus mutates in the cells, mm -hmm. and as that's going on, the cells not to get too technical, they, they pick up the RNA and they start attacking the, the good healthy cells. So they're destroying your natural CD4 count. As that CD4 count or T cells continues to be worn down, mm -hmm. then the progression is from an HIV virus into an AIDS, vi an AIDS diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But that's once the CD4 drops below 200 per milliliter of blood. Mm -hmm. And Chris, you have been living with HIV for how long? I've been living with HIV for 23 years. And what was your scenario? Where were you? What was going on in your life when you were diagnosed? When I was diagnosed, I was living in Los Angeles. Um, I was homeless and addicted to substances. Uh, and that's pretty much, I was, my risk was substance abuse risk, uh, as well as sexual behavior risk. So. I found myself infected with HIV. I uh, went to a homeless shelter to get tested and did not return for my results. So a disease investigation specialist was charged with having to find me and locate me and provide me my results to get me linked into care. So I found myself getting linked into a substance abuse treatment program. But there was a unique circumstance that existed. I mean, you, you were down and out. Mm -hmm. And so a college roommate, or was it a high school roommate? It was a college friend, friend. that was uh, working with the CDC and saw my name on the list uh, for notification and came out and took it upon himself to uh, locate me. So before we go to prevention and treatment and funding, uh, the, the question exists that there's a stigma that still exists. We, 
We've more or less, and one of the reasons for I decided to do this program was that we've really pushed it under the rug mm -hmm. and because there's a stigma that's a, assigned to this. Um, it, how, how bad is that stigma? Um, in, in some communities, it's, it's different in every community, first of all, but um, people don't want a label. They don't want to um, um, be connected to um, a name um, or a, an assumption. And an example would be um, men who have sex with men. Um, people who may or may not have sex with other men, say, uh, um, might not want to come in because they don't want to think people um, think that they're homosexual or gay. So people won't come in for that reason. People don't want to um, um, admit that, you know, they might have um, an injection drug use issue or some other uh, sexual behavior issue. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's, um, uh, especially in the black community, um, individuals feel that it's, it's not just geared towards the African-American and black community. So people are very afraid. Stacy. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, people are even afraid to speak about having unprotected sex. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's not something that you openly want to talk about with anyone. And so just that stigma alone is yeah. enough to keep people from coming well, in. Well, further, mm -hmm. you have uh, occupational hazards. Mm -hmm. It sure. could be a, a needle stick. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you could get it in a transfusion. Ryan White from Indiana mm -hmm. was an example of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, he acquired HIV from blood transfusion. Um, today, no, blood is screened very well mm -hmm. and you cannot get it from a transfusion anymore. But mm -hmm. yes, he did acquire it and unfortunately, um, as he was going through school and there was very limited help for him, it, back then it was AZT, the medications that uh, were available to him, he, he was ostracized, he was kicked out of schools, he, yeah, he was yeah. befriended, mm -hmm. you know. He was in middle school yes. and they didn't allow entry. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we re referenced uh, the African American community, Chris. Um, uh, it, it compared to the population, the population is of America is somewhere around 14 or 15 percent African American. Mm -hmm. Yet, Nationally. We, when it comes to HIV and AIDS, we represent over 50 percent of new infections. Ha half of new infections mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are African Americans. Which is very true because I went through our new patient trends. And that's exactly what's happening in Peoria. Between 2013 and 2014, we had a 53% increase in new HIV infection in this region and with and African American we, population. What we're, what we're attributing that to is simply because it's not because we're engaging in more risk behaviors. Right. It's not because of, you know, uh, engaged in substance using behaviors different than any other population. Mm -hmm. right. What we're seeing is this epidemic has concentrated itself in zip codes more or less, where you're seeing numbers of people living with HIV. And most of us tend to have sex or encounters with individuals that live in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those types of social determinants, as we call in public health, is that that's what's driving the epidemic and people not disclosing uh, or not simply mm -hmm. knowing their status. Absolutely. We know one in five people do not know their status. Of, of those who are actually, that have been, that, that have that HIV, have been. do not know it. Mm -hmm. One in five. One in yeah. five. Really? Um, so let's talk a little bit about prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, you handle prevention. I do. Um, at McLean County Health Department, um, I oversee two grants from the state, and we provide counseling and testing, and we provide um, sex um, supplies, condoms and lubes and things like that. Um, my role is to do counseling and testing, and counseling meaning what can, what can we identify to help reduce your risk for getting HIV. Mm -hmm. And um, people are um, coming in, we have different kinds of tests available. Um, some people might not want to come back for a test result, so we have a rapid finger stick that takes 15 minutes. Uh, we also do a blood draw that um, someone um, can have that done. Some people think blood is better mm -hmm. kind of a thing, so they want it, um, they want to do the whole test. So, um, and um, what's really important is getting out in the community and educating them because mm -hmm. there's individuals, and this goes back to stigma too, that people think, oh, they look okay and, you know, this person said they were okay, but people don't want to admit that they're um, positive maybe because they're af afraid of that uh, rejection or um, whatever might happen out of that. But also, um, uh, people might want to um, um, 
Well, let me let me turn to Chris because I don't want to lose that thought. Mm -hmm. um, rejection, things of that nature. You you kept quiet when you were first learned mm -hmm. of your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Back in the nineties, ninety two was when I was diagnosed. Um, people were literally dying from mm -hmm. AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because the medications weren't working. They were very powerful. It was actually a cancer treatment medica mm -hmm. medication um, that they were using on people living with HIV. So the manifestations of that treatment, you know, really took on a lot of physical ailments, uh, Carposi sarcoma, you know, spots that would appear on your face, your hair falling mm -hmm. out, your nails, skin pigmentations would discolor. So there were physical manifestations to those medications, mm -hmm. so there was a stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. And it has more or less evolved that no, you really don't see those physical manifestations anymore. It's simply because they attribute you being HIV positive with you probably being gay or you probably mm -hmm. being an injection drug mm -hmm. user mm -hmm. or sharing your injection paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. So be quiet. Yeah. So be quiet. Yeah. And we have criminalization laws across the nation that further stigmatize people living with HIV because it, you can have an allegation thrown at you that you willfully and maliciously and intentionally infected someone. And that may not be the case. We don't know what happens behind closed doors when two people may have consensual sex. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet those laws remain on the books. Those laws yeah. remain on the books. Yeah. Illinois did revise its law uh, uh, in 2012, so we're making progress, but there's still a lot of states that have it, simply because you spit on someone or simply because you've scratched at someone and being infected. Are there other diseases that you're aware of in the state of Illinois that have criminalization no. associated? No. HIV is the only no. disease that's being criminalized. Let me go back, uh, and I want to mm -hmm. talk about the treatment, and you sure. mentioned the, the drugs. We've, uh, of course, made great progress there, but I want to stay with prevention. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, you can, rec excuse me, you can recommend the use of condoms, limit mm -hmm. the number of sex partners, mm -hmm. things of that nature. How effective is that? Um, for some people, just um, having a conversation and acknowledging that um, they do have um, power and control and encouraging self-esteem, self-respect sometimes is very empowering for some folks and I have seen that over the years that people have changed their behaviors because they do come back to retest uh, one to two times a year mm -hmm. and, and those numbers of partners might have gone down or the, the, the frequency of getting condoms has gone up for them as well. Um, they might have had an STD or something that has scared them and, and um, you know kind of made them feel like oh I need to you know take care of myself. I'm constantly amazed at, with all the information that's available in per, you know, to prevent HIV, how many people don't know that mm -hmm. it's not going to lay dormant for mm -hmm. um, these, you know, so many years, and then they're just going to get sick, kind of a thing. So people, mm -hmm. people still need to be educated. Because yeah. that's exactly what the virus does. It mm -hmm. can, in some individuals, lay dormant in different lymph nodes throughout the system. Mm -hmm. I just went through a training and it can sit there for 10, 20 years before someone is symptomatic. Well, Chris, mm -hmm. how long before you even took medication? I actually began medications uh, last year, so 2014. Hmm. So you went 22 years without any medication after learning of your diagnosis? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, CDC has standards with relation to starting medications and getting on the treatments. And during the time from my infection to where I am today, it, that guidance has fluctuated. It's ebbed and flowed. And it's uh, now, if, as soon as you test positive, we want to get you started on medications because the likelihood of you transmitting that virus to someone else decreases by 96% mm -hmm. if you are adherent to your medications. Mm -hmm. uh, can we talk about PrEP and PEP? Uh, sure. Because PrEP Certainly. really is part of mm -hmm. the prevention. I mean, what, what mm -hmm. is PrEP and, as opposed to PEP? PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis where it is Truvada, a medication, an HIV medication that is prescribed to, for example, a partner of an individual who's living with HIV. So, and so if you're exposed, if you're uh, at risk of exposure, correct, mm -hmm. right, you correct. You would, but you're not diagnosed, correct, mm -hmm. right. You would take a medicine, and it falls under this prep correct. acronym, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. Along with that comes, you know, basic health maintenance. You have to get your labs done. You have to be monitored. You have to see a physician, and you get some intense counseling um, to help reduce your exposure um, risk. But it is that it, that is what PrEP is. Mm -hmm. And then we have post-exposure prophylaxis, which is PEP. 
And post-exposure mm -hmm. is that's associated with a needle stick, for, exa for example, an occupational exposure. That's mm -hmm. in PAP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's, let's turn to uh, medications. You went 22 years without taking any meds, and now you're on a med? Mm -hmm. I'm on Complera, which is a combination medication. Mm -hmm. And we don't call them cocktails anymore. I remember we, there was a time we called them cocktails. Mm -hmm. It's a combination mm -hmm. medication. And what, I mean, how many different meds are there? What kind of progress are we making with regard to medicines? The cocktails used to be individuals could be taking up to 20, 30 pills a day. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of different types of pills. Today, you can take a medication of one or two pills a day, and that's the combination that, that Chris is referring to. You're taking three different medications and you're putting them into one tablet. Mm -hmm. And how often do you take meds? I take my meds once a day. Just the, once a the day? The regimen is a required once a day. However, mm -hmm. back in the time that, you know, uh, as Pam was mentioning, uh, you would have to take several different pills mm -hmm. for the one that I'm taking now. Mm -hmm. And that would be at inter different intervals throughout the and day. Very and specifically mm -hmm. timed very intervals. Very specifically Excellent. timed yeah. intervals. And, and now we've gone from what are called classes. We've gone from two classes of medications to five classes of medications. Correct. Exactly. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's Which, important because you look, when we start talking about the HIV life cycle, the HIV virus attacks to a T cell. So it attaches itself. Once it embeds itself or fuses into that cell, it begins to mutate and multiply. So it creates what looks like another T cell and then it buds out from that T cell and then other T cell it mimics, it mutates so it mm -hmm. looks like it. So mm -hmm. other T cells are coming at it and it infects it. So the medications are charged with either stopping that progress at attachment, stopping that multiplication within the cell and also medications that will stop that budding out. So you've got different Three intervals different. of where those medications have their role. Mm -hmm. So if one medication as, as your body chemistry may change. Mm -hmm. You you have options now. You have options, and mm -hmm. as he was as he was speaking, he he mentioned mutation, because HIV is a very smart virus. It will develop resistance to medications if you are not 100 percent or at least 90 percent compliant with your medications, taking them at the same time every day, mm -hmm. um, missing at the absolute most one dose a week. Um, but you take the medications if you fail to become adherent or continue to take your medications as they're prescribed, the virus will build a resistance. It will mutate, it will get smart with that medication, and that medication will no longer work. Mm -hmm. So then we have to change the class of medications that you can take that will fight your virus. And with five classes, we're much better off than oh, we were. Oh, we're much better off than yeah. where we were. Much. Let, me, let me turn to supportive services, yeah. uh, Stacy. Mm -hmm. um, what are, what are some of the services? What's the most significant one that you can provide through uh, friends? You know, the one that, uh, and Pam and I spoke about this earlier, but our transportation services, we have 15 counties we cover, and a lot of that area is, is rural. So we have a driver that works part-time for us that will spend a lot of windshield time, but, but goes out and picks people up to get them to their care appointments. And why that's really important is because they, they need to be at their care appointments to make sure that they're remaining healthy, that they're getting their, their uh, blood levels checked and, and getting their medication. And if they can't get to their care appointments, that's not going to happen. So that's one of the, the really important things that Central Illinois Friends does is we provide that transportation service. I want to add to that list, but how important is that aspect for um, McLean County? It is very, very important um, that we have uh, um, Heart of Illinois services coming to McLean County to serve people in our county. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people would not be able to get to Peoria to get services. Mm -hmm. So it's very important, and they provide many services. It's not just for medication. So. And especially for the rural counties, mm -hmm. Hancock County, mm -hmm. Warren mm -hmm. County. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And the other piece of what we do is, is working with um, Positive Health Solutions is that we actually help people stay in their homes. If, if they're in, in a home, we want them to stay there and we want them to have a stable living environment because we know if they have a stable living environment, they're much more likely to stay in care than if they were homeless and we can't find them. It's unlikely that we're going to be able to get them into care. 
is, is so transportation is is critical. What other it services is. can you provide? I mean, is there rent and things of we, that nature? Yep, we do. We we through a subcontract, we're able to assist with rent payments regularly, as well as deposit payments, so people can get into safe housing. Um, we also, in the past, have done utility payments as well to make sure that people can keep their heat and their their water on. Um, Friends also has an emergency assistance fund, so it's those folks that fall through the gap that don't qualify for any of the other funding related to rent or utilities or whatever. We do have an emergency fund that's funded completely by our donor base, and those funds can be tapped into for people as well as they need in, for emergent needs. Bottom line, providing a stable environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making sure people are safe and that they can get to their care appointments. There's been a lot of discussion about funding. Governor Rauner has come in and he says we need to balance the state budget and everyone yeah. says yes we need to balance the state budget and he suggested 26 million dollar cut to the current year's uh, fiscal budget which ends June 30. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That apparently has been altered now or rescinded? Well, from, what, from what we understand as of uh, uh, an email some of us received last night is that he has rescinded uh, the budget cuts to the brothers and sisters united against HIV AIDS, BASUA, as well as with relation to the African American AIDS Response Act, which is a fund that basically provides prevention testing services throughout the state of Illinois for communities of color most impacted, uh, where the epidemiology incidence and prevalence uh, uh, shows. Uh, so that's what we know, but that's 2015 budget year. So 2016 uh, HIV lump sum is still up in the air. So we still need to yeah. be very vigilant, um, very active uh, when it comes to talking to our representatives and you know, making those phone calls, uh, requesting that those funds remain in place. Chris's reference to last night would be last week as you watch this program, so just keep that in mind because it, it's an ever-evolving budget gotcha. in Springfield. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. are, are your organizations affected by those uh, funding questions? Well, absolutely. One of the primary ways we do some of our outreach work is we borrow um, or are, have on loan a mobile unit that we use to drive out into certain areas um, of Peoria in particular, but other areas throughout central Illinois. And from that mobile unit, we do testing. And that mobile unit is called the Wellness on Wheels, and that's one of the areas that is looking at some significant cuts as well. And we depend on that because we're not going to get a whole lot of folks walking into uh -huh. our brick and mortar building and saying, hey, I'm here to get a test. Uh -huh. We find a lot of success, especially in Peoria, and this is not true of all communities, but in Peoria, we find a lot of success with meeting people where they work, live, and play and doing the testing right there at their convenience so there's no barriers to them getting that test uh -huh. done. And there's a question of matching funds, too, because you receive federal funding, Correct. but it's based upon a state match? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, through the Ryan White program, it's funding from HRSA, Health Resource Service Administration, federal money that comes into the CARE program. And it is an ex it's a requirement that the state of Illinois matches, through general revenue funds, a portion of the overall funding for CARE. So any funding that's coming from Illinois Department of Public Health, they have to match with general revenue funds. Yeah. If that match was unable to be made, that will ultimately have an impact on what's awarded to them federally. And that's true over in McLean County? Um, in McLean County, we get funding from two grants um, from the Illinois Department of Public Health, and every year it keeps going down and down, which means that that's less outreach we're able to do. <coughs> and it's very important to get out into the community to, to let people know who you are and, and what services you have and how safe it is for them to come in and, and get services, be it testing or, or referral to medical care. And so. if, if uh, funding goes down and down and cases go up and up, this is no. not no. a good cycle we're in. Mm -hmm. No. Well, if, the current, if, they, if they currently move forward with some of these cuts, we're going to mm -hmm. be reducing the opportunity to test over yeah. 5,000 people. Yeah. And mm -hmm. being getting tested is the first step to getting into care. Mm -hmm. And so, if we, in particular, if we're talking about populations most at risk, yeah. uh, injection drug users, people of color, um, men who have sex with men, you know, mm -hmm. these high risk populations or at risk populations, that's 5,000 tests that we won't be able to conduct. And it's not only just prevention. Our program does some HIV testing too. We do not do targeted testing. Mm -hmm. We have individuals that want to come in and just get an HIV test mm -hmm. just because. They don't want to go to the health department. 
again, mm -hmm. affiliated mm -hmm. with a stigma and they don't want people to know. We've only done 30 tests year to date. Out of those 30 tests, we've had three positives. Wow. And with that, we'll save the conversation to continue in your living room or wherever you might be. We thank you all for participating in this discussion. Let me say thank you to Erin Johnson of the McLean County Health Department and to Stacy mm -hmm. Wolf, thank who is you. with Central Illinois Friends, mm -hmm. and also to Chris Wade, who is living with HIV and obviously well versed in the topic, thank you. and Pam Briggs, who is with the uh, Heart of Illinois HIV AIDS Center at the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Peoria. Thank you for joining us on that issue. We'll be back next week with a discussion about stormwater utility fees. Are they taxes? Are they necessary? Well, we'll find out next week on At Issue.